as you can probably tell from the uh, quaver in my voice, I'm both uh, wildly excited and terrified to be here with you. So uh, this is me. <laughs> but if uh, you could uh, see inside me, this is what you would see right now. <laughs> so uh, before I get started, I'd like to uh, answer the, uh, the, the question that, that I always get asked, so just to, just to get it out of the, the way, maybe some of you have it. And uh, most people know me as the, the guy who wrote uh, Rainbow Boys. And uh, that's it there. And so the question I always get asked is, uh, who are the cute guys on the cover and <laughs> can I give you their phone numbers? And uh, no, I don't have their phone numbers. And uh, only one of the guys do I know who he is, and uh, that's the, the guy in the back there. Uh, does uh, anyone recognize him? Can't hear it. Matt Bomer. You may know him from the TV series uh, uh, White Collar. And, uh, or if you caught last year the movie The, the Normal Heart, yeah, he was in, the, in that. So uh, people are, are always you know, curious about uh, the story of, uh, let's go back to that, the story of uh, the, the cover of a book. And so when, when I was taking writing workshops, learning how to write, every single one of my writing instructors had about eight different writing instructors. They all said the same thing because, you know, everyone's always curious about the covers of books. And so all my writing instructors, they always said, just put it out of your mind. If you get your book published, they're never going to ask you your opinion about the cover. That's something that they do. You don't have any say in it, so just don't even think about it. So my first conversation with uh, my editor, he said, now what do you think we should do with the, for the cover? <laughs> and I'm like, um, I hadn't really thought about it. And he was like, well, we're gonna pitch this as a love triangle between three high school boys. So we're gonna put the, the three boys on the, on, on the cover. So then they, they had to go out and look for, for models or, you know, uh, ask modeling agencies. And so they were, you know, went to different model agencies and had them submit photos. And the art director, she was like, okay, well, we got uh, two of the guys, but for Jason, one of the guys, Jason uh, Carrillo, he's, he's supposed to be the really hot athlete jock guy, right? And of all the, you know, submissions of photos they were getting, there were never any that she thought were hot enough because the really hot guys like charge a lot of money and that was out of the, the, the book's budget. So she told me the story later on that, that she was at a, at a party at the editor's house and all of a sudden they see Matt Bomer. And this was back, he was like, like this, he was a soap opera star. He was on The Guiding Light and, and another one, I can't remember what. And uh, so the editor, he's like, he looks at Matt and he's like, but he doesn't look anything like the character in the story. Jason in the story, he's, he's dark complexion, Latino with brown eyes. And, and she's like, it doesn't matter. He's hot. He'll sell the book. And uh, sure enough, uh, he did. So uh, that's the, that's the, the story of... Uh, of the cover. That was him then, that's him now. So uh, it's really, a, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, it's because of uh, people like you, uh, teachers, educators, librarians, and future teachers and educators and librarians, that uh, so many people uh, learn about my books and, and read them. So it's thanks to you that so many teens get a hold of those books. We were talking last night about, you know, well, how do, how do young people, how do they find out about these books? And lots of times it's because of your roles in classrooms and schools and libraries. So you all are, are among my heroes. I really appreciate your efforts. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be doing what I do. So to, uh, you know, illustrate that and bring that point uh, home to you this morning, what I'd like to do is uh, share some of the emails that I've gotten 
uh, in response from students, uh, starting with uh, this one. Hi, Alex. I hope that by writing you, I am not taking up too much of your time. Every day I struggle with wondering who I am. I sort of think it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight. You fall in love with who you fall in love with. I don't know. I first saw Rainbow Boys in my high school library. I was too afraid to sign it out and risk letting out my secret, so I snuck it out of the library. <laughs> that night I read the whole book and was completely infatuated. I felt so amazing. And after reading it, and I know it sounds immature, but I kind of fell in love with the character Kyle. You probably think I'm a nut after reading that, but don't worry, I'm not. Then one day my friend brought Rainbow Boys to school and did her report on it. Then on the back I saw the ad for Rainbow High, the sequel, and immediately went to the town library and had them order it. When I got it, I again read it the first night. It was so amazing, and I don't know if I can wait until your next book. Please know that your books are making incredible differences in the world. If you have the time, please write me back. And don't worry, I returned Rainbow Boys to the library <laughs> so that others in my situation can use the book to help them. So one of my favorite quotes is uh, from uh, Helen Keller. You probably know this one. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. The boy whose email I read has already begun his daring adventure. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about my own. I'm originally from Mexico, and uh, when I was five years old, my family moved to Texas, immigrated to Texas. And as you can see, I quickly got into the Texas spirit. <laughs> There's another one that's me with my mom, who claims she never suspected I was gay. Um, really? <laughs> so, uh, as I now speak to groups, many people I, I've come to realize don't realize that up until the 1950s, and my family moved to Texas in the early 60s, up until the 1950s, in uh, Texas and much of the Southwest, all people of color, including Mexican American people, suffered the same sort of Jim Crow segregation that we typically identify with uh, African American people. People like me, immigrants from Mexico, had to attend separate schools, use separate eating places, water fountains, restrooms, hotels. When I arrived in Texas in 1962, desegregation had only recently taken place by a landmark ruling. You know, we always hear about Brown versus uh, Board of Education. There were actually four different cases around the country, all dealing with that, that sort of uh, segregation. So when I started school, I didn't speak any Spanish, and uh, other kids knew I was uh, from Mexico, and I got picked on for it. For the first time in my life, I experienced prejudice. Fortunately, though, my teachers never made fun of me or made me feel inadequate or inferior. With their help, I worked hard to learn English as fast as I could. In order to fit in, I quickly stopped speaking Spanish and learned I was light-skinned enough to pass as white. When my parents took me shopping or to a restaurant, I would tell them, speak only English, don't speak Spanish. Like most kids, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to belong. I wanted to be liked and accepted. And so I learned to lie about who I was. I learned to hide who I was. By the time I reached middle school, I'd buried a core part of myself, my Mexican heritage, deep inside me. I stopped being myself. I was no longer different. Or so I thought. I was in eighth grade when I first heard the word gay. That's me at 13, with the fake sideburns. <laughs> Teens nowadays will ask me, how could you not have heard the word gay until you were 13? I have to explain to them that this was back in the dark ages, 
before Will and Grace. <laughs> the early 1970s, when I was 13, were a time when gay people were truly invisible. You might occasionally hear someone whisper the word, homosexual. But there were no portrayals of gay people on TV. I knew of nobody who was gay. There was nobody out at the time. The word wasn't even used, out. By the way, uh, contrary to rumors you may have heard, Will is not my twin brother. <laughs> So at 13, when I first heard the word gay, I knew that's what I was. And I hated myself for it. I heard the name calling, the anti-gay slurs. At 13 years old, I believed that being gay was the worst thing in the world that a boy could be. And I thought I was the only one in the world who had the feelings I had. Nowadays, sometimes people will ask me, well, which was more difficult, growing up uh, with the prejudice of being a Mexican immigrant or being gay? And what I explained was that there's a big difference between the two. In terms of being an immigrant and getting picked on for being Mexican, I could talk to my parents or my brother uh, about that. They were all in the same position, learning English, experiencing that sort of prejudice learning to fit into a different culture, learn a new language. But how could I talk to my parents or my brother about the confused feelings I was having about being gay? I knew they weren't gay. Nor could I talk to my schoolmates about it. They made, f they made fun and jokes about gay people, or worse, and teachers never talked about it. Now, I do remember there was one boy in school who constantly got picked on for being queer. Whether he was or not, I don't know, but people thought he was. And consequently, he got beat up for it. I stood by, watching silent, afraid that if I spoke up, then people might suspect I was gay. I felt like a coward standing by. I felt shame for not saying anything. After school, alone in my room, I tell myself, I'm not going to feel this way. I refuse to let this happen to me. Like the boy in one of the novels I wrote, The God Box, I ask God, how can you let this happen? Please take away these feelings. I don't want to have them. But the feelings didn't go away. So just as I learned to hide that I was Mexican, I learned to hide that I was gay. Once again, I learned to lie about who I was. I became depressed, quiet, invisible, trying to escape calling attention to myself. Now one of the places that I escaped to was our school library. I estimate that, this, that the library probably had several thousand volumes in it. But how many of the books described how homophobia hurt kids like me? Not a single one. How many of those books told me it was okay to have the feelings that I was experiencing? None. I was so scared. My dad was a college professor, and so a couple of evenings I went to him when he was teaching classes. I went to the college library. I snuck over to the card catalog, to H, and looked up homosexual. I'd look around over my shoulder, make sure no one was watching. I'd creep over in between the stacks and pull out the books. And they were psychology books that talked about how homosexuality was a mental illness. I raced through high school, lonely and afraid, con convinced that, that I was sick. Eventually, I graduated. That's me at graduation. And uh, after graduation, went on to college. And that's when I first began to meet other gay people, at least people who I knew were gay. By then, it was the mid to late, actually the late 1970s, and times were changing fast as gay people began to come out. And I began slowly to let go 
of my hatred of myself for being gay. I started to accept myself. Eventually, I graduated, went on and got a master's degree in guidance and counseling, began, became a youth and family counselor, working to help discriminated populations of Latino, black, Asian teens and their families. I started to reclaim my Mexican heritage and regain my fluency in Spanish. And at night alone, I began to write. But my writing just wasn't very honest. I was still hiding. I was still hating myself. What I've learned since then is that fiction is all about emotional honesty. It's about climbing into characters' skin and experiencing the world through their eyes their feelings, their thoughts, their emotions. It's like when we're writing or when we're reading, it's like holding up a mirror. And when I would try to write, whenever it started becoming too personal, too honest, then I would get scared. And conveniently enough, I'd think, you know what, I'm going to put this aside. I've got a better idea. And so I'd start writing a new one. And eventually, it would start getting too personal, too close. And I'd come up with an even better idea. Well, eventually I had all these stacks of unfinished manuscripts. And I realized I couldn't do this by myself. It was just too scary. So I reached out to two friends I had at the time. One was a, a paper mache artist. The other was a songwriter. And we began to encourage each other. With their help, I began to write more honestly. And I found myself writing about high school, about being different, about getting picked on and harassed. Writing was a way to heal. It was a way to find my voice. And finally, my novel, Rainbow Boys, was published eight years after I started it, my longest relationship ever. <laughs> In the months prior to publication, I was a total nervous wreck. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was terrified what people would say. Then my editor phoned with a first review. It came from School Library Journal, which recommends to schools and libraries whether they should buy certain books for their students. A librarian wrote, quote, there will no doubt be challenges to Rainbow Boys, much like the challenges to Judy Bloom's Forever when it was published in the 1970s. But please, have the courage to make it available to those who will need it. It can open eyes and change lives. Huh? My book changed lives? I thought for sure they'd gotten it mixed up with someone else's book. As I read the reviews, I realized that I'd written the book I wished I could have read when I was a teen. A book that would have told me, be true to yourself. It's okay to be who you are. You're not alone. And then the emails began to pour in, like this one from a girl. Dear Mr. Sanchez, I live in a really homophobic town, and it was refreshing to read about characters dealing with that in high school, especially when things like that are happening to me in junior high. Sex hardly ever gets addressed, especially homosexual issues. And yet we deal with homophobia every day. It was nice to know we're not alone. I've been slowly coming out as bisexual, but lately it's been really hard, and the only people who know are my closest friends. And even then, some of my friends I find myself lying to for fear they would ditch me. Your book inspired me a lot, and maybe someday I'll feel confident enough to completely come out. Anyway, I got to go. Just want to tell you, your book rocked. And this one from a boy. Dear Alex, thank you so much for your books. I spent eight years knowing I was gay, but not telling anyone because I thought I was the only one who felt the way I did about guys. Then I read your books. And I decided to come out at my high school, homecoming, coronation. I was homecoming king. 
And the principal made a speech about what a model student I was and how I was a representative of the school, blah, blah, blah. So I went up to give my speech and um, I'm gay, kind of slipped out. The principal ran up and grabbed the mic from me and said how I was out of line. I ended up getting kicked off of like five activities and I didn't make the football, basketball, or baseball team even though I was captain in all three my junior year. And I wasn't sure whether they're allowed to do that. I mean, I'm not a bad athlete or anything. I talked to my parents about it, and they said that it was my fault for being gay. The only people who seemed to be okay with me being gay was church, which was great because without them, I might not have made it. So this email is so long just because I needed to tell someone and thanks for your books. Here's an email from a, from a teacher. Alex, I'm a high school teacher, and somehow your book, which I hadn't heard of, was on my bookshelf when I got to school in September. I didn't pay it any attention until a new student joined our school. He is out and proud. <clears throat> he also could barely read. He has lots of learning disabilities and had dropped out. Our school is for dropouts. Thank God he found my classroom, and thank God I had your book. I gave it to him, and he read it carefully, page by page, calling me over often to read aloud to him and help him make sense of the book. He couldn't believe someone had written down his experience. He turned the book in Friday after keeping it about two months. Thanks again. <laughs> Excuse me if I get weepy reading these. Sometimes teachers will ask me, at what age is it appropriate to start to discuss these issues? And well, here's an email from a boy. I am 11, and I have read Rainbow Boys, Rainbow High, and So Hard to Say. I love them. Are you doing a new rainbow blank book? And I want to come out to my dad. Am I too young to be gay? And I have a major crush on this boy at school. What should I do? <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, well, how can you know you're gay at such a young age? To which my response is, at what age did you know you were straight? This boy knows what he feels in his heart. He already knows who he is. The question is, will we help him understand who he is? Or will we leave him isolated and vulnerable? Books can help. You can help by getting those books to students. Books can help but uh, to create a school environment which in, in which all students can feel included and safe and accepted. So after, uh, after uh, Rainbow Boys and the sequel Rainbow, Rainbow High, as I went out talking to uh, teachers and, and librarians, I would hear from them, we, Rainbow Boys is great, but we really need something for middle school students, specifically about middle school. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, well what would be the story? What would be the good story for, for middle school? So along the way, I started getting more and more emails like this one from a straight girl. Mr. Sanchez, I just recently found out about your book through my ex-boyfriend. You see, we recently broke up after a long relationship. After our breakup, he started reading your book, Rainbow Boys. He told a mutual friend that it really spoke to him. He says he now knows for sure about his sexuality. I never realized that the guy I had fallen in love with would be gay. This came to me as a shock. But I know that I must be bigger than the initial shock. I love him and want him to be happy, no matter who he is with. But I'm afraid this journey will get the best of him. Thank you for helping me to understand what he's going through, so that way I can help him. 
Well, like I said, I started getting so many emails like this, like it's become this rite of passage for, for high school girls in the US to fall in love with, with guys who they find out is gay. So as a result, I thought, well, that's my story. That's my story for a middle, middle grade novel. And so I wrote uh, So Hard to Say. The response has been like, like this one. You know, sometimes, sometimes I get emails from parents. And here's one, here's one from a dad. Mr. Sanchez, I am the father of six children. The one son at the one son at home, the one home, <laughs> the one son still at home is fourteen. I have long suspected he is gay. He could have been the model for Frederick in your boy so hard in your book so hard to say, which I read recently. Last weekend, with some trepidation, I decided to give the book to him to read. He disappeared into his room where he stayed for most of the day. He didn't put the book down, reading it entirely in one sitting. When he finished it, he asked me if we could talk. I sat down with him in his room, but we didn't talk at all. <laughs> he held on to me, and the tears just flowed from each of us. Your book gave him the courage to finally accept himself and come out to the world. I cannot thank you enough. Ever since Columbine, schools are talking more and more about bullying. Homophobic name calling bullying are used to put down any student, gay or straight. When we as adults allow homophobic bullying and anti-gay name calling to persist, we're hurting the straight students alongside the gay ones. And there are 10 times as many straight students. Homophobia hurts everybody. Not only the gay kid who comes out, but also the straight kid sitting next to him or her. Think about the straight boy who likes art or drama, but leaves it because he's told that's gay. Or the straight girl who likes sports or mechanics but leaves it because she's called a lesbian for it. To imply that somebody is gay is one of the most effective and pervasive forms of bullying. Teens know this, they experience it. They're waiting for us as adults to get it. One way to help, again, is through books. The reality is that young people today already know gay people friends, brothers, sisters, relatives, parents. Here's an email from a straight boy. Dear Alex, I'm straight, not gay. But I've read your books. They're compelling. I love them. I see myself as a mix of the guys in them. I'm like the character Kyle in the aspect of the bookworm nerdy kid, and like the character Jason in the aspect that I find life somewhat confusing. People call me fag or homo and names like that daily, although I know I'm not gay. And I hate how people try to classify me. Maybe that's why I love your books, and I hope to get the new ones soon. Thank you for writing them. So as a result of emails like that one, I decided to write a story about the friendship between a straight boy and a gay boy. The result was getting it, and now I don't have his phone number either. <laughs> getting it, you know, it's again like, how do I come up? How do I how do I come up with what would be the story? And so at the time, I don't know if you all remember, there was this program called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, in which these 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 five queer guys gave a makeover to the straight guy so he could get the girl. And so I thought that's a perfect story for for high schoolers. So it's a story about the straight boy who really wants the girl, and so he gets the gay guy to help him. So here's an email in response. Hi, Mr. Sanchez. As we know, most of young society today doesn't read. And if they do read, it's the Twilight series. I was one of those. But 
During my freshman year, I was assigned to read a book and to do a presentation. Me being me, I hated reading, especially in English, since I'm bilingual. As I was doing my book selection, the cover of Getting It got my attention. At first, I was like, whatever. I'm not going to read it anyways. But then something called me towards reading the book. And as I read the first chapter, I was like, hey, the main character is Mexican, and he's like my age, and he's just like me. The book was so addicting that I just couldn't stop reading. And I just had to find out more and more of what was going to happen next. And ever since, I've read all your books and just started reading bait. I now know the passion for reading. Why? Because of your books. One of the things that happened, you know, in response to my first novel, uh, Rainbow Boys, since it was about the three boys, I tried to figure out, well, how can I make each one of the boys distinct? And, you know, as a writer, it's like I draw from all my experiences. So I thought, well, let me make one of the boys uh, Latino. And so uh, Jason, the one that Matt, <laughs> Matt Bomer portrayed, he was supposed to be the Latino guy. Well, that was just a way to distinguish him. The response I got were so many emails from Latino young people telling me how, how empowering it was for them to finally read about a Latino teenager in a book. It goes back to what uh, uh, SJ was saying earlier about you know, how, how books can be you know, mirrors and windows for young people, that when they can see themselves in them, then that inspires them to read. So since then, all of my books have been with uh, a Mexican-American protagonist, even though that's not what the stories are about. That's just part of who they are. Now, sometimes people ask me, well, now what about the issue of religion? So much anti-gay bias is justified. People justify it based on, on religion. In the years since my first novel was published, I'd occasionally receive emails like this one from a boy. Being gay and Christian is the hardest thing in the world. One day at church, the pastor said the worst things about gay people. It was so hard for me not to cry, and my mom, who I'd just come out to, stared at me with a sorry feeling. But I still love God, and no matter what anyone says, I am what I am. And this one. My parents are very staunch Christians, and when they found out about my homosexuality, they sent me for counseling. It didn't really work. My parents now think that I'm okay. Only I know that my sexuality hasn't changed at all. I love being a Christian, and I know that Christianity is real. But according to church doctrines, homosexuality is wrong. Now I don't know where to turn. These letters took me back to my own prayers and confusion about God when I was growing up. Those times when I felt so scared that I'd ask God, why is this happening to me? Please don't let this happen. Take away these feelings. It was because of these emails that I wrote uh, my novel, The God Box. And the response had been emails like this one. Hi, Alex. I know this may sound weird, but your book, The God Box, saved my life. I was filled with hate for myself upon reading your book it made me lose my addiction to cutting and gave me self-confidence I never had before. And now that you've changed my life so drastically, that's not enough for me. I want to change the environment of my school to make it safer for others. I intend to start a Gay Straight Alliance group ASAP. Thank you so much for changing my life so positively. My next novel, Bait, took me on a whole Took, helped me take on a whole new cultural taboo. Being sexually abused as a boy. And that's another part of my growing up story. A part that took me years to work up the courage to write about. I never imagined that one day I'd be able to talk about it. Mention it to anybody else. Much less to stand up in front of a crowd like you all. But I know that it's also a story shared by many of you, both men and women, and many young people. The result of the book has been emails like this one from a boy. 
I just finished reading your book, Bait. This one really hit close to home. Just like the protagonist, Diego, I had trouble letting go of the abuse that happened to me when I was growing up. I also questioned whether my feelings for guys were the outcome of the abuse. I took refuge in trying to pray to God to change me and make me, quote, a real man. I went through obstacles like trying to be straight and seeing everybody happy with somebody else, everybody but me. Now I'm finally proud to not be seen as a freak and feel comfortable in my own skin. I do get flashes of the molestation and rapes that took place, but after bait, I am very much ready to let go. So thank you, Mr. Sanchez, for creating a world with people that learn to love themselves and be happy and are not ashamed to be who they are. Over the years, I also often received emails from bisexual teens like this one. For the past 10 years, I have been attracted to both girls and boys. But I was told that bisexuality was the worst thing to be, by gay friends and straight friends. Even though I don't like, even though I don't like girls and boys 50-50, there are some girls I find so sexy that I just want to grab and kiss them. But then there are boys that I find that are so sexy and I want to grab and kiss them too. I have nobody to talk to about this and I feel all alone. I'm afraid that if I come out as bi, people will not take me seriously. They will just think, me, think of it as a stupid phase that I'm going through and I'll grow out of it. Even though I don't want to grow out of it. What should I do? In response, I wrote my latest novel, Boyfriends with Girlfriends. You know, for a while, I wondered why so many people took the time to write me and share their stories with me. I've come to understand that they write me not to say that I've written a wonderful piece of literature, but that in these books, they've stopped hating themselves. They have discovered that they are a person worth being, that they are a person worth loving. That's really what these emails are saying. Maybe some of you recognize her. Jane Goodall, the naturalist, teaches us something amazing. She says, in the life of a songbird, if that egg is taken from the nest and hatched and raised by birds other than its own kind so that it doesn't hear its own song in the first month of its life, it will never be able to sing its own song. It will never find its own true voice. But for humans, there's an amazing thing even if we never got our true song from our parents, and some of us didn't, we can still learn it. It's in there to be touched and brought into life. Because in the end, that song is who we are. It's our voice. Another email. Hi, I'm 17 years old and I'm gay and still in the closet. My family goes to church, so if I told them, they would nail me to a cross and light me on fire. I'm so scared to tell people how I feel. I get made fun of at school all the time. I hate it. My high school English teacher was reading this book called The God Box, and I asked, what is that? I love this part. She gave me the book and said, read it and you'll find out what it is. So I read the book and this is the best book I've ever read. I cried so many times because I knew just how the protagonist felt in your story. Your book changed my life and I hope one day I will be able to tell people about me and be loved. Well, I just wanted to say this great book touched me deeply, 
and I hope God will love me the way I am, gay and a Christian. Thanks to a teacher like you, this boy found his song. As I receive these emails, I think back to the boy I watched get beat up when I was in high school and how I didn't have the courage to stand up for him then. I'm standing up for him now and for thousands of others, boys and girls all across the world. My success with writing came only when I was finally able to stop hating myself and accept myself and stop trying to be someone else. Only when I stopped hiding who I was did my writing acquire a voice. And I've discovered a function to my writing I never man imagined. In school, I'd been taught to read and write in terms of commas and metaphors and symbols. I was never taught to think of writing in books as agents of social change, able to inspire, empower, and change lives. I've come to accept myself as a writer who not only tells stories, but who does so in a way that helps create change in the world by encouraging others to be true to who they are. That my books can do this ceaselessly amazes me. It's given a meaning and purpose to my life I never imagined. That's my mom again. She was a watercolor artist, an art teacher, and also my greatest teacher. She taught me that each of us should try to make the world better. As I've spoken to young people and adults across the country, what I come to understand, of this is, understand is this. Each of us, each of you, has that same opportunity to transfer, transform the world into a better place in your own individual way, one person at a time. How can you do that? Well, many of you in this room, I suspect, are already doing that, either by coming out as gay or as coming out as a straight ally, as someone who supports justice and equal rights for all Americans, including gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender Americans. When my publisher first bought my manuscript, they were very excited about it and saw it as, as groundbreaking because the, the, the young people in it would be connecting. The three boys were connecting. But they were concerned whether there'd be enough audience for the book to justify you know, buying it. There'd be enough sales of the book. They knew that gay and lesbian young people would buy it, but that's a small minority. What none of us ever foresaw was what has turned out to be the biggest audience for my books. Straight teenage girls. Now why is that? <laughs> I can just picture them walking through the bookstore or through the library, and all of a sudden they say, oh, cute guys. They pick up the book and they read the back cover and they're like, oh, they're gay. And they're curious. And then they start reading, and all of a sudden, they're getting inside boys' hearts and minds. Endless source of fascination for straight teenage girls. <laughs> that the boys are gay, that's sort of like a bonus. And what I've also discovered is that there's a real spirit of social justice in so many young girls, straight girls. As many of you probably already know, if you go to Gay Straight Alliances, how many of them are actually being led by straight young people, primarily girls, who also bring in the boys, and who see it you know, as an important social justice issue. So the reason I've shared all this with you is not to impress you with how cool I am or how weird I am, I'm actually no more cool or no more weird than any of you. We're all cool and we're all weird in our own way. We're all sometimes lonely, sometimes scared. We've all been hurt. We're all somehow wounded. And too often we try to hide those hurts and wounds. And yet it is through those hurts and wounds and shame and embarrassment 
that we connect with each other. That's how we heal each other. That's the great lesson that my writing has taught me. And that is what these emails have taught me. The poet Mark Nepo tells this story. In the West, the word sincere goes back to the Renaissance. During that time, there were so many amazing artistic geniuses everywhere. So in this profusion of sculptors, amazing sculptors in Italy, there was a huge number of stone sellers. They were everywhere. There were many that were honest, authentic sellers, and there were fraudulent sellers. One way that the fraudulent sellers would try to pass off damaged marble was they would get a piece of marble that had a crack in it and they would put wax in it and polish the wax and sell it as a pure piece of marble. Well, the word sin sinecera in Latin means without wax. So very quickly, an honest, authentic stone seller was one who didn't hide the cracks or the flaws in the stone. And it wasn't long after that that the metaphor and the analogy came to be that an honest person, a sincere person, doesn't hide the flaws in their humanity, doesn't hide the cracks in their character or their heart. The cracks in our hearts are how we connect with each other. So I'd, uh, I think we're getting a little, little, little short of time, right? So I'm going to just close your eyes for a while I flash through to the next part. So I'd like to start wrapping up with another email to inspire you. Dear Mr. Sanchez, I thought it was a great sin against God to be gay. I openly spoke out against anyone who was gay until my English teacher made my class do an assignment on a book that would change my life. I accidentally picked your name out of a hat. When I found out your book was about gay teens, I didn't want anything to do with it. I told my teacher I would take an F rather than read a book about gays. However, I forced myself to read it. And I found myself unable to put the book down. During class, my teachers would have to take the book from my hands so I could focus. When I was done with the book, I had a whole new outlook on anyone who is gay. I felt ashamed because I was trying to help kids not accept who they are. Soon after that, I joined the Gay Straight Alliance. Within two months, your book became the peace saver in my school. It was no longer in the library. Kids were on the waiting list for it. It joined kids who were gay and who weren't together. So I would like to thank you so much for writing your books. Thank you for giving me a whole new pair of eyes. Each of us has that same opportunity to let go of hate and see the world with a whole new pair of eyes. As I've spoken to teachers and librarians around the country, I found out that, that sometimes when you try to use or try to use books like this, you're faced with, with challenges from unsupportive administrators or from parents. What can you do when you're challenged about a book? Ask those who are challenging. Do you want a school where all students feel included? Do you want a school where all students feel accepted and safe? That's really what this is about. So what can you do when you hear that ubiquitous in the hall, that's so gay, or other sorts of slurs and put downs? I suggest that you use it as a, a teachable moment. You don't necessarily have to come out. What you can say is your truth, that you know gay and lesbian people who you care about, who are your friends, your relatives, who you love, and that it hurts you when you hear people using something like that in a derogatory, 
put-down sort of way. Allow yourself to show your wounds, your hurts. And I think you'll find young people connect with that in the same way they've connected with my books. We all really just want to be loved. I'd like to share with you a, a poem from the 14th century Persian poet Hafiz. It's called With That Moon Language. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do not say this out loud. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. One last email to inspire you. Dear Mr. Sanchez, I just want to say that I loved your books, every minute of them. When I finished reading Rainbow Road, I actually started crying, which was awkward because it was during my biology midterm. <laughs> A bunch of my friends have read your books too. My high school is totally the place to go to if you're a gay teenager. We are very accepting and have a wicked active GSA. To give you an idea of how accepting we are, a few years ago, we as a GSA went to a conference. In the first part of the conference, the floor was open for people to share their stories about coming out or struggles of being gay. Well, for perhaps an hour, Teen after teen stood up and told the most horrid, gut-wrenching stories you've ever heard about getting beat up, getting kicked out, getting disowned. Our kids didn't say a word. As they were wrapping up the story portion and getting ready to move on, one of our kids raised his hand and asked if he could tell a quick story. They said he could, and he and his boyfriend stood up hand in hand. He said, I know you guys all had these really sad stories, but I just thought you should know our high school is like really the best school in the world to come out at. No one hates you. And all the girls just really want to go shopping with you. <laughs> Everyone rolled with laughter. These kids are among my heroes, and you are among my heroes. We all need heroes, heroes like you. To get these books into young people's hands, to make our schools safe from homophobia and bullying for all students, to create schools in which all students can feel included and accepted. The world is changing so quickly. When I was growing up, I never would have imagined that one day there would be same-sex marriage. It's up to each of us to decide what part we want to play in that change. One of my favorite quotes is probably one of your favorites too. And I'll end with that one. It's from Gandhi. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Have courage. You too will change lives. Thank you. <laughs>